Hi, welcome to Biology Weekly. Today we have a special guest with us. I'm happy to welcome Shelby Travis. Hi. So I'm Shelby, and I am here today to talk about colorectal cancer. Um, so we'll basically just be going over screening and prevention. All right, so here is colorectal cancer at a glance. Um, it is the third most common cancer in the world, and it is the second most common cause of cancer death in the world. Um, most cases are in those over age 50, and um, incidence of colorectal cancer is expected to actually increase by 63% by 2040. Uh, fortunately, deaths from colorectal cancer are decreasing due to the earlier detection rate and better treatments that we have now. Um, the incidence is decreasing in the older population, but we're actually seeing it increase in the younger population, which is defined as like less than 55 years old. Um, and as we'll see later in this presentation, due to this, um, screening measures have changed and so have the age of which screening starts. Okay, so what are some risk factors for colorectal cancer? Um, in terms of modifiable risk factors, like things you can do to possibly decrease your chance of getting it, um, include ob obesity, smoking and alcohol use, a sedentary lifestyle, and diets that are high in red meats and processed meats, and diets that are low in fiber. Um, and kind of in association with these risk factors, they're honestly associated with a lot of other cancers and a lot of other medical diseases. So it's always nice to be cognizant about these things and, you know, being aware of your diet, your exercise, and uh, possibly other social things you do, and uh, just being aware of what you're doing and um, just being cognizant about it. Uh, Non-modifiable risk factors, so things that you can't really do to change um, that are increased with colorectal cancer, include the age. So the older you get, the more likely you are to develop cancer. Um, and ethnicity. Um, it's more commonly seen in Native Americans and African Americans. Um, there are higher rates of colorectal cancer. Um, family history of colorectal cancer and a personal history of polyps. So, you know, if you go in for your screening and um, the physician finds polyps and, it, you know, they send it off to pathology, um, if they do come back abnormal, as we'll get into later, you'll probably come back for more screening more frequently because now you are at an increase, increased risk of colorectal cancer. Um, those with inflammatory bowel diseases, um, it includes like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. They have an increased risk of colorectal cancer just because they have a lot of inflammation going on in their colon. And then if you have a genetic conditions, um, some of these, if you've heard of them, like familial metanomatous polyposis or hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer, those are examples of genetic conditions that can increase your chance of uh, colon cancer. So moving on, what are symptoms you should be looking out for uh, for colorectal cancer? Um, early on in the disease, it's actually asymptomatic. If you think of your colon kind of as a big tube, if you just had like a little bump or a little polyp coming off of it, it doesn't really cause a lot of problems and therefore you might not even know that you have cancer occurring and that's why screening is so important. Um, later on in the disease, you might see changes in uh, the thickness of your stool, uh, the frequency of how often you're going to the bathroom, possibly the consistency of the stool. Um, you should be on the lookout for blood in your stool. As cancer grows, it grows blood vessels with it, and those blood vessels can become leaky, and that's you know how you might see some blood in your stool. Um, in regards to that, it can either be bright red, which you'd be hopefully be able to see in your um, bathroom and that usually means it's coming from the lower GI tract or it might be darker kind of like a maroon dark color and that usually indicates to your physician that it's coming from higher up in your GI tract um, but it'd be useful to look for both. Uh, you may also experience some fatigue and weight loss though they're just common symptoms of cancer and the fatigue may also be in part from losing blood in your stool. Um, and then you might have just some abdominal pain and cramping. 
Um, so these signs collectively all together could be a sign something's going on and would definitely be something you'd want to talk to your physician about. Um, that's not to say anybody who has abdominal pain needs to go and get screened for colon cancer, but just in all of many of these things are happening, it'd be a good idea to see your physician about it. All right, so what types of screening are there? So this diagram kind of has all the different types that you can do. However, what I think is the most important point from this slide is just to get screened. Um, as we'll talk about, the colonoscopy is the gold standard of screening, but as long as you get screened, I think you're doing your part. Um, as always, you should talk to your physician about which tests would be most appropriate for you. Um, you may also want to check in like with your insurances. Some insurance may cover fully one test, may not cover another test at all. So that's also something to be aware about when to be aware about um, in regards of what test might be right for you. Um, and another thing to point out is if you do not get a colonoscopy and you decide to do one of these other testings, if it does come back abnormal, your physician will um, often recommend as the next step to get a colonoscopy anyways. Um, but to start us off, uh, we'll just talk about a colonoscopy. It is the gold standard. Um, they use a scope, which is a camera, and it has a light on it. And they um, put it within you, and it kind of lights up your whole colon. They use some gas to kind of distend your colon so they can get a better view of everything. And it helps them visualize the entire colon. And not only can they look around, but if they are to find a polyp, they are able to remove it. And they can send it off to the pathologist who can then take a look at it and say, oh, these are normal cells, abnormal cells, um, and whatnot. So not only are they looking at it, but hopefully they also might be able to diagnose um, any pathology that might be occurring. Um, if all is normal, uh, they generally will recommend you come back in 10 years. So it's a pretty big time span for you to have off in between screening modalities. Um, and then if it is abnormal, it's really up to the physician of what they found of how often they want you to come back. It could be anywhere from one year to three years, five years. Um, the one thing about colonoscopy is it does require like a, a bowel prep, they call it. Um, you often have to drink type of like laxative or medication. Sometimes these are now in pill form, but essentially helps clear out your GI tract and gets all the food and liquid out of it. So when they do insert the camera, it's a clean view and they can clearly see all the walls and, and make sure that, you know, no polyps are hiding behind any food that's been left behind. So, um, you know, not everyone likes the bowel prep. It can be a little time consuming, but it is definitely necessary. Uh, all right, so moving on, kind of like um, a colonoscopy, it's called a flexible sigmoidoscopy. It is in that um, bottom middle in the picture. So those, it's essentially kind of like a colonoscopy. Um, however, it doesn't go as far. It doesn't get to your whole colon. It only gets to that very first bottom portion of your colon. Um, and you're like, well, Shelby, why would you do that? Um, it's technically considered less invasive, right? Because you're not going as far. And because you're not going as far, you don't have to be under anesthesia as long. Um, which, yeah, back to colonoscopy, you definitely, you're usually put under anesthesia for that. Um, so anybody, you know, who might, they don't want under anesthesia for a very long time, you know, a sigmoidoscopy might be something that's recommended for them. It's the same thing. It's a scope with a camera and a light. You're still going to blow up the colon with some air just to get a better visualization. Um, it can also, you can also take biopsies from this and you would still need to do a, a bowel prep just to clean out the colon. Um, these are usually performed every five years because you're not getting as good of a look as a colonoscopy would. All right, so the next thing you can do is like a CT colonography. So this is actually just a type of imaging, and this is in the bottom right hand of the image. Um, so you've probably heard of getting a CT for other things, um, and this takes images of your colon. Um, so it's not invasive. All you have to do is go into a machine, um, but it does involve radiation exposure. 
Um, they also might insert a tube into you to just kind of blow up your colon a little bit with some air just so that they can better visualize the colon on the pictures. Um, and it basically lets the physician uh, look at your anatomy and see if they see any abnormal areas on the image. And again, because it's not as um, invasive and you don't get a perfect look at the colon, you would need to be doing it every five years. Uh, you can also do stool DNA tests. So that is in the bottom left of the picture. Uh, so cancer, when it's within you, um, it can like shed its cells a lot and then we can pick up those cancer cells uh, within the stool. So um, this one is an option that could be nice if you're a little bit nervous about an, how invasive a colonoscopy was or you wanted to do it from the comfort of your own home. All you have to do is put in a stool sample inside. They usually give you like a little container and then send it off. So, you know, it's pretty much from the comfort of your own home. Um, not only is it testing for cancer cells, but it can also test for blood within the stool that the cancer might be leaking off. Um, but because it's not as, you know, it's not the gold standard of a colonoscopy, you're going to need to do it more frequently. It's about every three years. Um, and it does not require a bowel prep at all because, well, you need to go to the bathroom in order to do this one. Uh, next up is a fecal immunochemical test. This is in the top right. This one is testing for just blood. It is not testing for cancer cells in the stool. Um, it does not require any bowel prep. Um, and you don't have to like worry about like uh, eating certain foods or can I take certain medications. You can carry out your normal diet and whatnot. And again, this one will just collect your stool in a container and then they will run it and see if they find any blood in it that the cancer might be leaking off. Um, it might have false positive, which is something to be aware of. And if you did have a false positive or a positive, um, your physician might recommend that you go on and get a colonoscopy. Well, this one you're doing every year, again, because it's not as sensitive. And the last type of screening you can do is called a fecal occult blood test, also in the top right of this image. So this also tests for blood in the stool, just like the FIT test. However, it uses a certain chemical in this test to detect the blood that it often does have a reaction with certain medications a patient might be taking or certain foods that a patient might be eating. So there are more restrictions with this test in terms of when you can use it. Um, and again, it's a stool sample. You put it in a container and you send it off and you want to be doing this yearly because it's not as sensitive. All right, so what are the screening recommendations? So on the left side, we have kind of the general population, um, which is new. So it used to be that everyone would start um, screening for their colon cancer, their for colonoscopy, or whatever type of screening you may choose at 50 years old. However, just about two years ago, the new recommendation changed to now starting at 45 years old. And this is because there's been an incidence of colon cancer in the younger population. So we wanted to start screening from a younger age. Um, how often you rescreen then depends on the test of choice that you used and if it came back normal, abnormal, um, your phys physician will be able to guide you on now how often do you need to be doing uh, your screening test. Um, when can you stop screening? Most guidelines recommend through 75. Um, however, if you're a very healthy 75 year old, you don't really have any more comorbidities or any risk factors, then you might choose to continue to keep screening after 75. Um, you know, you'll want to have a discussion with your physician if there's benefits or risks for you to keep screening. Again, if you want to do a colonoscopy, you do have to be put under anesthesia. Um, Older individuals can have a harder time with anesthesia, but if you're, you know, like I said, a healthy 75-year-old with no comorbidities, then it still might be a perfect thing for you to do. Um, on the flip side, though, if you are unhealthier or, you know, your life expectancy maybe isn't going to reach farther than 75, they might recommend at that point at 75 to stop with um, screening at that point. 
um, in the at-risk population. So these are people who have family members with colon cancer, um, maybe they have inflammatory bowel disease, whatnot. At, for the at-risk population, it is very, very highly recommended that they screen with colonoscopies. I know the last slide, we just went over all the different screening modalities, but because these patients are at risk, um, colonoscopy is going to be the gold standard for these type of patients. Um, so if you do have a first degree relative with colon cancer, your screening timeline changes in regards to the, from the general population. So you will either start at 40 years old or 10 years before uh, your family member got diagnosed. So if your family member got diagnosed when they were 45 years old, you need to start training at 35 years old. Um, if your family member got diagnosed at 72 years old, you're like, oh, well, that would mean 62 years old. No, now you go back to whatever age is the earliest. So that'd be the 40-year-old recommendation. Um, those with inflammatory bowel disease, because they have a lot of inflammation going on within the colon, they should be screened um, eight years after they were diagnosed. So a lot of young patients have this disease. So if they were diagnosed at 16 years old, they need to start colon cancer screening at 16 plus 8. 24 years old is when they should start screening. And they should be doing it every one to three years, you know, depending on what the physician may find and what they recommend at that point. Um, so that's just notable because uh, young, that's when younger patients need to start being screened is when they have inflammatory bowel disease. And then lastly, if you have a genetic condition that can put you at risk for colon cancer, you might be getting them at an even younger age. Um, it depends on what type of genetic condition you may have. Um, for instance, there's one called familial adenomyositis polyposis syndrome, and they will start screening at age 10 um, because they can already have many polyps at that point that can be undergoing cancerous change. And often they have to get colon or a colonectomy where they remove the colon at a very earlier age because of it. So you know, those are your kiddos and teens that are going to start to be getting colon cancer screenings. All right, so all this talk, well, how do we prevent colon cancer? Uh, make sure you're eating a healthy, balanced diet. Really get your fiber up. You want to limit red and processed meat. Um, it's not to say you can't have any, but, you know, be cognizant of how much you're eating in a week. Um, like I said, increase your fiber. Fruits and veggies are always good. Uh, if you can, try and avoid alcohol and tobacco products as they are carcinogenic, not just for colon cancer, but for a lot of different cancers. And try and incorporate some exercise into your daily routine to maintain that healthy weight. And here are my references. That is all I have for you guys. Thanks for joining in.